I just want to see evidence of Carter's bootlicking approach to Duran with the students. Now, bear, bear, just bear this out. Remember, as soon as the students were, were arrested, and, and right away the propaganda mill of, of Iran started working, they're going to put our hostages on the spies. Now, this has two consequences. Number one, Carter would lose the election if anything happened to our hostages. And the other is, this is an effect giving the Iranian students in this country a license to do anything. All they do is go on a rampage, and, and, and then, uh, it, then the, the administration backs down because they threaten, they threaten us, and threaten us, and it's an effect a license to steal. Mm -hmm. Now, you know that these, these Iranians, that what they were doing, they'll say freedom of speech. What they were doing is just violating the freedom of speech of their opponents. You notice who came out of the woodwork with blood dripping on his hands from the Ghana massacre? Mm -hmm. Terry Mark Lane. Mm -hmm. Hey, that, Barry, we should have interned the entire Iranian diplomatic staff when they were in this country. But, I mean, on day one. On day one. Sure, we want to sit in an airplane. I agree with you, and I don't want to over-agree with you now. It's an election year, and I will bend over backwards to give pro-Carter sentiment its time on these microphones. It's one thing to look out the window of a plane and say, holy mackerel, this isn't the way I went last time. And then 10 minutes later, holy mackerel, uh, I wonder if he knows, if he knows where he's going. And holy mackerel, this is the wrong way. All those three things are a passenger musing out a window. Sorry. But when the pilot opens the door and walks back in and says, has anybody here got a map? Uh, then, then you know that your suspicions were confirmed. Now, when President Carter said, I have just learned a big lesson about the Soviet Union after Afghanistan. Sorry. Ooh. I was... Why shouldn't we? Uh, look for the Sergeant James Lopez said that the hostages collectively got to despise the clergy. We've discussed this, how they were handpicked. They were pro-Iran. And, and in the Times, he said, if you run into to, uh, Reverend Rupert, we're spitting his face for me. He, he, he didn't mention his name, he said, because I passed him a note telling him, telling him that we were being uh, tortured there, mm -hmm. and he turned that note over to the Iranians. What? Yes, yes, it was in the Times. I well, really, if we had only gotten wise to some of the so-called clergy in Vietnam uh, at that time, yeah. but they... You know, they came away kissed by tongues of flame, and we regarded them as holy men. I'm glad these boys were exposed in time. Now, one of the most impressive... Can you imagine me thirsting to get on that television show this morning and wishing I never would because I wanted to keep on watching a man named Rabbi Jaffe. Rabbi Jaffe from Newburgh, New York, who is the rabbi who went to Iran, not with this group of clergy, okay? And his criticisms of that group were so elegant. I wonder if the rabbi meant to be that good. I wonder if he's what we call in sports a natural. Uh, he, uh, forgive me, just let me finish my point, sir, then I'll let you make another one. Uh, rabbi Jaffe on Channel 7 this morning uh, on Good Morning New York did not spring the length of his chain and sink his fangs into the other clergymen, but with great finesse and in fact love pointed out that the other clergy did not do their job. They got sucked up to Ayatollah's exhaust pipe. They came back. They gave us a phony story. He talked about his efforts to, to share notes with them and influence them and how they simply said, Rabbi, we just don't have time to hear the rest of your story. And I cannot praise Rabbi Jaffe sufficiently for the manner in which he put that other group down and uh, he served the Jewish community, he served America, he even it was burning in me, you know, um, so if you work in a restaurant, then you, you know, you get free veal cutlets or something. One of the fringe benefits of my job is I learn things that you can't prove in court, you can't even say on the air, but you can go through life and know, you know it. Because we see, we decide who's right and who's wrong by who chickens out. The chickening out is very, very rarely done so the public can see it. For instance, at that television station this morning, one of the other clergy was supposed to come. And at the last minute, they had to move, remove one of the chairs because that other clergyman, who, believe me, would have been blistered by the hostages for what he did over there, uh, he called and said he was ill and uh, 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 sorry to disappoint the television producers, but he couldn't make it. Now, do you understand why that appeals to me so much? You know, being right... The, the uh, institute in there was a carbon copy of the institute that Mr. Uh, Bryant belonged to, along with Marcus Rodkin, who was quite a South Palm himself. He was a darling of, of most of the lefty in academia. Uh, Marcus Rodkin was a very good friend of mine. He was a
entitled. Well, you're absolutely right, Marty. Absolutely right. And uh, if we were to listen to the likes of this uh, individual, uh, we would uh, actually be, the logical conclusion is unilateral disarmament. And uh, I agree with you, Marty. You're the person to call and really size it up for what it is. I thank you, Marty. This is about that Springbok incident. And I, I want to tell you what I, I forgot to tell him because it's very important about Kerry. You see, Governor Kerry is playing play politics with this. He knuckles under to black groups that are putting up this protest. He has nothing to lose because the, the groups that oppose, uh, to, to support them are, are, are ap apathetic. And meanwhile, he's afraid of losing a very black and liberal vote if he runs for governor again. Now, I want to talk about Norman Naylor. You know, uh, for the first time ever, on uh, Barry Farber's show last night, both liberals and conservatives agreed that Norman Naylor was a skunk. <laughs> that's what they said on the Barry Farber program. They, they all kept telling Oh, my, oh, my, what liberals. language. No, 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 and, and also, you know... Didn't uh, they say kind of, sort of? No, but anyways, what I say is, you know, during the 30s and 40s, if you disagreed with someone, he was a fascist. If you were losing the argument, he, you said he was illegitimate, fascist and illegitimate. Then in 65, the same thing, he became a racist, if you're, if you're arguing with someone. Now, Norman Mayer has revived fascism. I heard the interview on radio, and he, it, these are his words. He says, when we take people and throw them in prison and throw away the key, that's fascism. Now, the biggest fascist in the United States is Norman Mayer. Now, you know, I'm glad to know that Joe Stalin, Georgi Malenkov, Nikita Khrushchev, and Leonid Brezhnev, and the rest of those swine in the Kremlin never threw anybody in jail mm -hmm. and uh, never executed anybody. Thank one you. One thing, Bob, can I say one thing? Yes. Yeah. You, you see the picture of Ragtime? No. Uh, Norman Mailer played Stanford White, who had his head blown off by Harry K. Uh. Saw. And uh, I, I thought maybe this was a precursor of what might happen. No, I have no intention of seeing Reds, Ragtime, Pennies from Heaven. Uh. There's a whole host of pictures that I, I, I feel proud to have avoided. Thank you. This is what happened. The fraternity ran a party, and they sent out invitations and asked the, those who came to the party to bring a welfare check, a father if they had one, and a radio bigger than their head. Now, uh, the president of uh, Cincinnati, who was at Rutgers in Newark, I know him then, was just as spineless in Cincinnati as he was in, in Newark. <laughs> These things happened in Newark. So, uh, it, it, it's a but you see, you didn't tell the audience what the motif of the party was. I forgot that, Bob. I know what happened. The motif was because on the 15th was someone's birthday. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, now I, I see now what it was, yes. It was Marty. It was Martin Luther King's birthday. Right, and it was supposed to be a Martin Luther King yeah. uh, a birthday celebration a la this fraternity's rather extremely poor taste uh, fun, quote unquote, fun. May, may I first think he's doing the same thing it did when it. It curtailed the freedom of speech of people with controversial ideas. William Shockley, Henry Kissinger, Walt Rothstow. Absolutely. And this is, this is the, same, the same tradition. It's no different. Well, let's, we tried to get the fraternity on the line. They are so scared. They are so shook that they're afraid to even talk to us. They don't know who, who's calling. They don't. That is Marty from Roselle Park. Yes, Marty. Uh, listen, uh, Bob, I, I want to uh, let your readers know something that's been disturbing me. As you know, it's from the Wayne Williams trial. Ever since the trial, before the trial, and after the trial, there were attempts by many, quote, leaders, unquote, to make this a racial issue. For example, on cable television, the mother of Wayne Williams called the judge, who was black, an Uncle Tom. NBC showed uh, parishioners coming out of a church in Harlem and saying, no way he could have done that. He would, I couldn't believe he'd kill a black would kill all those blacks. Then along comes Joseph Lowry and gets Andrew Young to, to uh, keep the task force going. There are a lot of unanswered questions. These are his words. Today there was a, a compare. It, it was called the biggest cover-up since Watergate. The next thing you'll hear is that the Klan is involved. I mean, this is what they're saying. If you remember, Herbert Daughtry led a march to City Hall to protest the racist killings in Atlanta. Pravda had an, an editorial, the racist killings in Atlanta. And you know what's going on. The, the attempt of the demagogues to sell racial hatred, racial polarity. Like, as you know, many of these leaders could only exist if they sell racial animosity. Well, there are people who do, uh, who do indulge in demagoguery or racial demagoguery, whatever you want to call it. But uh, I think uh, what, is, what is sad is that, the, that Lee Brown, who, by the way, is the police director in Atlanta and who is black, wanted to disband the task force because he saw no need to maintain it at the expense that it uh, entails and felt that since Williams was convicted, that cleared at least 23 
murders. He felt it cleared all of them, but uh, 23 he could say with any amount of uh, certainty. And the, it made sense to discontinue the task force. We want guys sitting around looking, you know, looking at each other, smoking cigars, and uh, saying who's going off for sandwiches now. But they're they're keeping the task force together because of uh, political pressure. No, yes. Lowry. Yeah, uh, well, huh? Joe Joe Lowry, of course, uh, was just uh, the focal point. But uh, there's other people besides Lowry. Uh, but uh, do you notice that there has been a word of retraction from those that led these marches? Uh, the green and, and uh, the green and yellow ribbons, which became a political symbol, mm -hmm. and all, all the, uh, it was so disappointing to many uh, of these. I, I, I know, I know, and of course, you have to be a, a, a big hypocrite not to, not to say you can't uh, help but compare the uh, the Williams trial and the aftermath and the pre-trial with, uh, say, the one, uh, John Wayne Gacy trial or uh, the uh, Corey trial, which of course involved. Uh, uh, even more uh, young people than the uh, Williams killings did. Uh, but of course, in Houston? Uh, yeah, the one, that was the Corey trial in Houston, the John Wayne Gacy trial, of course, in Illinois, in which if you combine the uh, victims of both of those, you come up with about 50, 52 uh, young uh, white males who were all murdered. Uh, but um, and then again, uh, no one uh, saw any need to make a racial issue out of that. Bob? Yes? This is Marty from Roosevelt Park. I, 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 you know, there was a peace demonstration in Moscow Saturday. It was in the past star ledger Sunday, and then it uh, was confirmed on the radio just now. There were 10 members there compared to 750,000. There were 11 members. Ten were there. They were surrounded by the police, taken to the station, and told to stop it. The only thing they, they were allowed to do was do what the official Soviet Peace Committee tells them. Today, the flash came in that the 11th was arrested. It's quite a difference in numbers, isn't it? It's about the... Uh, well, you, uh, here, uh, Marty, you seem to be pretty astute in this area. Uh, see if any of these names are familiar to you uh, from uh, another era. Ruth Messenger, George Wald, yes. Marge Piercy, Seymour Melman, and here's one for you. Here's the grabber to end all grabbers, Dave Dellinger. Yes, yes, Dave Dellinger was featured in, in this thing, according to the paper, and uh, he, he, I, let me say this, uh, I've been told, now, I can't prove this, that uh, I was told, and I can't give you my source, that the, uh, the, the federal government knows that David Dulger and another one, a woman, were getting money from North Vietnam to, uh, to foster peace movements. It was laundered through so many French banks. Well, Dave has, uh, uh, Dellinger has uh, visited uh, Hanoi and uh, made no, uh, made no bones about where he stood in that war. He was uh, pro Hanoi without uh, any question. Uh, uh, one of uh, the, uh, the other talk show station was, was crying with the, with the demonstrators Saturday. The gentleman was British, and he used the expression, uh, all he wants is, wants is peace in our time. Now, you and I would recoil at that. And he gave his age. He was born in 1935. So I called him was up. Was he born I, in South Africa? What's that? Was he born in South Africa? I don't know. He's British. Uh, I want me to give his name? I, I now, I don't want his name, but uh, does he sound as though he has all the answers in the universe? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. So I, I called him up and I said, you know, you were four years of age in 1939, and I recall Neville Chamberlain using that very expression, peace in our time, and 30 million people died as a result of that. And he got very, very angry, <laughs> told me to send, send anything I wanted to the FBI or anything. Oh, he got sarcastic. And, but uh, I, 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 it, it shows the mentality, peace in our time. There's appeasement, there's constant appeasement that, that swept these. A lot of them are doing it deliberately, as you said, to weaken us, and a lot of them are just dragged in. Yeah. They're not, they're Is that same, would that same uh, individual have uh, the same last name as our seventh president? Yes, yes. Uh, From Tennessee. Yeah. Hermitage, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, I know the uh, gentleman, having worked with him, and uh, he, uh, he's part and parcel of the whole uh, liberal panoply of, uh, yes. of people who uh, have been uh, uh, reciting the same litany for a couple of decades now. One on Sunday nights at midnight, too. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marty. This is Marty from Roselle Park. Yes? I'm so when you mentioned Dorothy Rubin, was because I have here an article I won't read, I'll just tell you about it, from the Wall Street Journal, June 10th, right before the this, the uh, freeze rally, in which it's called the Building Blocks of the Freeze Movement, in which she, she says, for example, one prominent peace group said that all life on Earth is threatened by U.S. imperialism. She exposes all the Marxist groups that are in on that. And yeah. She, she's, a, she's a brilliant writer. She
She certainly is, and a uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, shrewd analyzer of the scene. Down to that now. Fight in your own weight class as hard as you can, and collectively we'll bring America back, just like the ones who did the opposite did so much to bring it down. Harry, a, yes. a few more comments on last night's show. Yes. A woman was, was uh, rather an illiterate, who was resorting to the 1968 uh, tactic of just uh, saying racism and everything. Exactly. You, you would become a, a desiccated liver tablet as soon as someone said that to you. Exactly. And the, the attorney was a typical one on the left who... Uh, who would uh, just try to obfuscate the issue with, with jargon and so on. Now, if you notice, all the people that have walked off your show are all liberal or to the left. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, it, it's going to happen again because they don't like freedom of speech. They don't, and I, I applaud you for exposing their left ideas. Now, may I just tell you an incident about one of your former walkies, Sir. an op-checker? Uh, before I retired, he came to school once, and he was talking to his history club in Biden. A big crowd was there, and he was talking about Dr. Daniel Williams, a black man who performed the first open-heart surgery in the United States, which he did. And he said, and that man, that great scientist, was denied the directorship of a hospital. And there was a gasp there. What was he you're supposed to think? My God, this is racist. So I stood up. I'm familiar with the case. And I said, Dr. Abchecker, isn't it true that he lost the directorship of a hospital not once but twice and each time to another black man? You know, I was sitting in the back where you could see that the color drained from that man's face. <laughs> he got very hostile. Yeah. Because it, that, that's exactly what they do, just pound away at this nonsense mm -hmm. and, and racism, bigotry, right. poverty, uh, murder, and so on. Am I correct? Yes, you are correct, sir, and I have to tell you one thing. You, you have helped me crystallize uh, my feeling about that show last night. You're right, the, 19, the same old 1968 shell game. And like so many tired shell games, I had the feeling that uh, I would have if somebody came up to me and said, would you like to buy the Brooklyn Bridge? Or the way a good-looking woman might feel if you said, haven't I met you someplace before? The only answer is, yes, is that the best you can do? Give me a break. Barry, Barry, yes. again, I'm going to abandon that great place, Guilford Courthouse. Make a few quick statements. You know how I feel. I feel as you do. First, a uh, few quick statements on the main subject. Uh, last night, uh, uh, Abby Hoffman was on one, of, on one of the talk shows, and he did the same thing. He was being asked the most innocuous questions. He was uncomfortable. He wanted to leave. And I realized that, that these people on the left don't like cross-examination. They just like to get make their statements, draw out all sorts of bills, and just build up these things, atrocities, and so on. He was saying, I, I feel uncomfortable here. I don't feel like staying. Mm. <laughs> now, the mm. other thing, as you know, I'm a military historian. When you mentioned Charles Wiley, I don't know where he got that, but it's absolutely right. Quincy Wright, in his book, A Study of War, said the same thing. He said that peace movements, no matter how unfortunate, lead to war. The hostility of the nation turns not against aggressors, but against the peace movers. Not only that, but the peace movement gives the enemy the illusion that there's right. rottenness on the inside. There's no will to fight. There's only a will to surrender and disarm and all the rest. Now, now uh, about about the rally, you were you were right. There, the, there was a repetition. I think I don't think the Democratic Party will hold a convention. They had it Saturday. Uh -huh. And uh, the rock music was great. I mean, for rock music, devotees. It was a marvelous summer festival. Yeah, but, but again, you see, I, I felt nauseous, nauseous when, uh, for example, Peter Yarrow, Peter, Paul, and Mary, uh, who you know confessed in, in an open court that he was a child molester and threw himself on the mercy of the court, this high moral person, all right, sir, forgive me. I'm not only high in moral, I'm out of time. Uh, I like all your remarks, except the last one. It was ad hominem. I don't think we I know need... I it wasn't ad hominem. I meant to Okay, but I don't think we need that to buttress your greater point. Anyway, I think it's more important in today's world than the famous Guilford Courthouse. Do you know that a, a peace group was invited to Russia? I have the article here from the Times last week. Uh, by the Soviet Peace Committee, who's been trying to discredit the United States, they were allowed to go into Leningrad, with their t even with their T-shirts saying USSR, stop testing now, led by Daniel Ellsberg. Now, if you've been in Leningrad, and so have I, you know, Nevsky Boulevard is about 16 lanes wide. It's not bullets, Nevsky Prospect. About uh, one, one or two cars an hour. Now, they started handing out leaflets, and they were surrounded by officials, escorted back to the, and putting up placards, escorted back to the boat, towed out to the Gulf of Finland and told to go home. Did you know that? I did not know that. And I have the article here. I'll be very happy to mail it. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I 
I'll take you. Matter of fact, I was wondering where Daniel Ellsberg is now. We have uh, alien and sedition laws. We have treaties and laws. We, uh, we have uh, spies. Uh, we, we, we even catch a few still, and we have spy trials. If you uh, they know that there are loads of Jewish anti-Semites, I can quote. Why don't you just solve the Palestinian house for Lillian Paul? Let it burn time with this party with the black panthers who are going Already an old friend of yours. I just wanted to, I wanted to speak about uh, Jesse Jackson, but he, he, shook in, he shook hands with Ramsey Clark. Who then? And uh, uh, did Ramsey Clark uh, uh, lick uh, his left boot first or his right boot? How did he? I don't know because I didn't tape it and I couldn't. Uh, yes. I want to just make my weekly call about Jesse Jackson's anti-Semitism. We get our basis on his uh, about his anti-Semitism from his statements. Now, one of his most famous statements was in that infamous uh, meeting in 1978 where the anti-Semitism had fired Russell was so thick you could cut it with a knife. He said, one, the, he said the Klan doesn't, just doesn't trade with South Africa. The Klan uh, didn't press the Bakke case. The Klan doesn't, uh, didn't press Randall was young, leaving you to say, who did it? The Jews. And, it was, it, and, and they stood up and cheered lustily. Now, uh, 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 Percy Sutton followed him and said, after all I did for the Jews, this is what they do to me now. They get Andrew Young out of a job. And also, Jesse Jackson's campaign manager in New York is Albert Vance, who led the anti-Semitic tirade against the Jewish teachers, whoever teachers were Jewish in 1968, and says in New York Magazine, in my judgment, I have never been an anti-Semite. Jesse Jackson says, I'm not an anti-Semite. All he does, uh, we have records of him saying, uh, uh, the international Jewish bankers, I want to embellish, add to what you said about Andrew Young because it's the it's bigotry. It's what uh, Mayor Koch said about Andrew Young when I certainly second the mayor and I agree with the mayor. There is a double standard. Can you imagine if Ed Koch had uh, criticized somebody and saying, hey, uh, you know, those smart-ass black boys around him, well, there'd be hell to pay. And yet, Andy Young can make a bigoted statement and nobody dares, outside of Ed Koch, nobody dares say a word. That's that. You know, the, you know, for the first time in the campaign, Mondale showed some guts when he said, if Jackson doesn't want to, Mr. Jackson doesn't want to cooperate, I'll go it alone. Immediately, the Black Solidarity Party line swung into action and uh, started condemning him. And, uh, you know, Andrew Young said that in front of a, a, the National Association of Black Journalists. Yeah. He was trying to have... I wonder what would happen if... Um I wonder what would happen if somebody spoke before an organization of white journalists. And, and use the expression smart-ass white boys. Yeah. He, especially the word boys. For years, blacks used to say yeah. plantation. They were called boys when they were 60. This was denigrating. But now, to say the same thing, Andrew Young is, is now and always has been a bigot and a con man and an opportunist. Oh, without a doubt. a great uh, One of the great hypocrites of all time. Uh, but I don't condemn him as much as I do with all the uh, cowards, with the exception of Ed Koch, who are in public life. Sure. Ed Koch is the only guy that is not afraid of this uh, racial thing. A couple of months away, but uh, on April 12th, yeah. on April 12th, we're going to have a commemoration uh, to be announced at a later date as to uh, the site commemoration for Philip Cardillo. I have um, kept the promise that I made to his parents, to his widow, to his children, uh, to uh, members of the PBA, that I would never forget Philip Cardillo, even though the Tower of Jelly committed uh, a horrendous act of, uh, of incredible cowardice by uh, not wanting to see the murderer of Philip Cardillo brought to justice. But you know that, that was one of the darkest days in the history of what was once a great city. But you know what the, what that the pastor of that mosque said, Mr. Farrakhan said when asked how he got shot, he just grit, showed his teeth and maybe he shot himself with a big grin. See, so we know what you know what we're dealing with. Last night you had uh, Lisa Sleva on. Yes. I saw her husband earlier in the evening on Crossfire. Uh huh. With Pat, with Tom Braden, the Boris liberal. And he was debating Alan Dershowitz. Right. Now, here's uh, Curtis Sliwa, who's rather well-spoken. I don't know what his education is, but he demolished one of the leading minds, the legal legal minds in the country. After when when uh, Dershowitz started quoting all legal he could find, the Sliwa asked him a simple question: Why don't you come out of your ivory, ivory tower, ivory tower, and ride in the subway? Well, Dershowitz started stuttering, and he said, "I, I took the subway tonight to get to the studio because he was in New York and Sliwa was in Washington." But uh, uh, it, it made me sick because if you read uh, Dershowitz's book for the defense, he says that 80% of those
ones he got acquitted were guilty. See, he, he's brought Well, he's just bragging. He just wants people to know what a great uh, li a lawyer he yeah, is, if, how he can get guilty people off. Yeah, but if true, he's part of the problem. See, only Perry Mason defended truly innocent people. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, That's why Perry Mason won 100%. Dershowitz won only uh, uh, 90, what, 6%? Yeah. I, uh, By the way, I did happen to see that uh, broadcast because it is repeated in the middle of the night. Yes, 1 o'clock. And uh, it uh, was uh, quite uh, quite electrifying, although Tom Braden looks as though he's so badly constipated it makes me nervous. I've never seen a, a warmer and nicer human being. You said you had a triple bypass? Yeah, a quadruple, yes. Quadruple? And you, you were, you're back home in three days? I was, no, 16 days ago. Oh, 16 days. About four days now. Uh, see, I only missed two shows, right? The day of the operation and the two days after. Probably three shows. But you made my, my, my days, my nights there. And incidentally, the, you know, your show can be a good soporific because the more interesting it gets, the more relaxed you get and you fall asleep. <laughs> Oh, boy. It's true. No, I found that. Did I fall asleep with it? Well, then we'll keep, we'll keep, we'll try to keep it dull so you don't fall asleep. Oh, I, I, well, Marty, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. To, to think that you only missed two shows in 16 days. Three, three shows. I three shows in 16 days. Yeah.